Hi everyone, I'm Lee Travers from Binance Australia. We're a fully compliant and progressive Australian fintech serving Australian retail and institutional clients on how to access low cost digital asset and products. And I'm here today with Tom Dunleavy from Masari. What's Masari all about, Tom? Welcome, thanks for having me. Uh, Masari is a research data and analytics firm um, focused on providing best in class research to our institutional and retail clients, as well as serving protocols, exchanges like yourself with data analytics and uh, tools to help them um, you know, better do their, their day to day jobs. Awesome, Tom. Yeah, fantastic. I think while we're here today is we've recently done a survey for the Binance Australia customers. And what you've asked for is to hear more information about the threats, some of the opportunity um, that are in the market. So we're taking that feedback on board and we're getting in touch with one of the experts today. So if you want to have your say, like we're doing today, we're going through actual questions that have come through from users over our social media. Please follow us on our socials, Twitter, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. We're across all of those. And that way, next time you've got a question, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. What do you want to know about the market? So we've really dialed it into five broad topics. You know, what about the, the macro market that our users want to know? Uh, obviously, a bit on regulation and government. Not too heavy on that today. Um, the investment approach that you could use when coming into the digital asset market. We are going to go into the technicals, so deep into what are some of the layer two opportunities, uh, a bit more about consensus mechanisms, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll touch on NFTs. And finally, we'll round out with user adoption and decentralization. You know, what do we need for that to happen and, and obviously why it's important? You ready? You ready to get into it? Let's go. Awesome. So first question we had is the markets. We're sort of broadening that into three, three buckets. We've got Asia, Europe, and the US. What are those markets doing? Who's buying and who's selling? Well, I think everyone's selling, right? Since May has basically been straight down. But uh, you know, if you look across the board right now, um, crypto adoption is really uh, broadened out among countries that have had corruption, inflation, political instability. And you've seen that in certain reports like the chain analysis report that is released um, annually, the countries that rank the highest countries like Ukraine, India, Pakistan, Russia, China, Nigeria, Brazil, all those countries that have the issues that I just mentioned, um, you know, particularly around the war in Ukraine and Russia, those numbers of crypto holders have ticked up precipitously. Um, so you can see, you know, those trends sort of come to the surface. Uh, if we think about sort of Asia, uh, you know, a lot of those folks, while they may not be experiencing inflation or not as much uh, corruption, they are um, a much more sort of digitally first, digitally native uh, economy um, as compared to the U.S. or even Europe. So you've seen a lot of the, the sort of uh, Asian countries continue to be buyers throughout this period. Um, the top person, the top country on the list uh, for chain analysis is, is actually um, Vietnam. So you've wow. seen a lot of those, those are Asian countries actually continue to purchase uh, crypto. Um, Europe actually has been outside of Ukraine, um, you know, somewhat of a laggard in crypto adoption. Um, but as we've recently seen the pound and the euro sell off, you've seen a lot of volumes move up uh, in Bitcoin in particular. So sort of a flight to potentially what could be seen as a store of value. And interestingly enough, if you look at other crypto assets like Ethereum, who you may consider sort of more of a world computer um, or, you know, more of a kind of a tech play, um, they, uh, Ethereum has not actually seen that same number of volumes. So, uh, you know, you're starting to see more adoption in Europe as they have their own problems. Uh, if we look at the U.S., you know, the U.S., uh, you know, has, has been um, adopting crypto for quite some time, but it's mostly been sort of the younger generation, uh, you know, as, a, you know, 
wealth is transferred over to them as they've, uh, you know, gained money throughout the pandemic. Those are the first folks to sort of, um, you know, purchase crypto. But, you know, the U.S. Uh, use case for crypto, I think, is a little less concrete than it is in those other areas, um, despite having higher inflation now, uh, you know, despite what some may be, per you know, perceive as uh, levels of political instability. The U.S. is has certainly, you know, lagged those other regions that are really sort of diving into crypto, despite the bear market and still continuing to buy. But, um, I, you know, that certainly could change as we have more concrete regulation and we have a lot more clarity um, within the U.S., not only for retail, but also for institutions who, who could move into the space in more uh, meaningful numbers. Yeah, brilliant. Awesome to go through the world like that. It's not just about, you know, what currency moves are. It's, it's also about what's happening in each of these different regions from a user adoption point of view. And, you know, it takes me back to, you know, when uh, we saw the Cyprus bail in and banks took users' deposits in the region, big spike in demand for crypto. Uh, when we saw more recently, you know, China and Hong Kong tensions, there was a big interest in, in Bitcoin then. And then probably the third time that I can recall would have been uh, around the period of Brexit, when that vote happened, there was a lot of interest in crypto. So, yeah, these sort of uh, geopolitical events uh, that we're seeing uh, are really going to bring more adoption into the market, which is which is awesome. Uh, the second you, one we had. Sorry, mate. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, you know, I think a lot of people would naturally also think gold would uh, go up in a scenario like that, another sort of store of value asset, but. In the most recent sell-offs from both the pound and the euro, uh, gold is actually sold off. So um, not a changing of the guard, I think, to Bitcoin, but just an interesting data point uh, potentially along the way. Yeah, definitely. We've, we've seen a lot of volatility in equities and just looking at the more short-term time, short time horizon, I, I think Bitcoin and crypto is holding up relatively well to sort of how those markets have been doing. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think they really have. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of the selling we saw earlier this year in May was really uh, forced selling through liquidations, uh, you know, based on three arrows and, and others. And it brought Bitcoin, Ethereum, the other major assets below a level, which I would consider sort of the, the new baseline, the long term holders, the folks who are incrementally adding on every dip. Um, you know, you have the core group of people who really are not willing to sell these assets at, at almost any price at this point. But you do have folks who are getting, you know, liquidated through being over leveraged or, you know, traders sort of moving the price around. You know, I think we've sort of reached close to the level where where we have the long term holders that are continually adding. Um, so, you know, if we do continue to see sell offs in equities, which, um, you know, certainly could happen. It'll be interesting to watch, and I think it's my base case that we stay around these levels because of the lack of forced sellers um, in the market. There could be potentially Bitcoin miners or others who uh, have liquidations, but I think the parties who actually could meet those thresholds are, are relatively few and far between at this point. Um, so it's been encouraging to see Bitcoin and Ethereum hold up, but um, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Certainly, there's more tests ahead. Yeah, yeah, fair point there. And on the miners, I have been seeing them raise some capital. So yeah, hopefully that sort of keeps any any forced selling out of the market from from that sector of of the marketplace. Yeah, and mining hash rate has reached an all time high again. So their job is certainly not getting any easier at this point. No, no, good point. Um, and just in terms of so the regulation, the government side of things, uh, I've talked quite a lot about how. Australia has been held back by a lack of clear regulation, which is present, uh, preventing institutions from really diving into this market. Um, how are you seeing the US and, and other markets? If we get clarity on regulation, what do you think it means for crypto? Clarity on regulation, I think, is probably the biggest uh, driver of um, less incremental flows into crypto at the, mo at the moment. To move crypto ahead to... Uh, certainly move the market cap, we need a new set of buyers that are willing to put capital to work. And I think a lot of people have said, beat in the drum, the institutions are coming for a long time, but they need clarity. They need comfort that their assets are not going to be seized or, you know, Ethereum or other assets aren't going to be declared a security tomorrow and suddenly sell off. Um, you know, they need comfort 
before they can actually move into the space in meaningful, uh, meaningful numbers. Once they have that, and it seems it will start with at least stable coins um, in the US, which will be a, a nice step forward. I think you will start to see some folks more meaningfully allocate, especially um, folks who want to make this part of their portfolio. So I want a one, two, three percent position to Bitcoin as an institution or a pension or an endowment, whatever. But you know, right now I can't do that. If you know, we get a little more clarity, you know, th those folks probably can, and it makes it a little easier to uh, to sort of move the ball forward. Um, and I think stable coins are a good place to start because. That is the lifeblood of DeFi. It is, you know, the taps of liquidity. And I'm hopeful that we're not going to get, um, you know, punitive regulations in that regard. But uh, that is certainly a risk over the next quarter or so. And I think something could be coming down the pike in, in Washington here in the U.S. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for those insights. So let's, let's stay on government. Um, and it's not the typical question that I get from governments allocating around uh, central bank digital currency or, or Bitcoin uh, as a percentage of a central bank balance sheet, but um, an interesting one. When do you think governments will start to interact and use NFTs? Um, not for a very long time is my first. <laughs> I think the first foray could be in some sort of identification, right? Like birth certificate, social security number, something like that, that is, um, you know, immutable on chain. And, um, you know, it could be an easy way for this technology to be used by uh, a very uh, slow moving uh, entity um, who's who's immune to change. So, you know, government's probably gonna be the last of the table here. And you could just sort of see even in the most forward thinking governments, if you look at the EU, um, you know, they released MICA uh, um, and sort of signed off on it in the last few weeks. There's no real mention of NFTs in there. They're starting with stable coins, they're starting with DeFi, and they've talked about discussing NFTs sort of down the line. Um, you know, the only way governments have sort of uh, decided to crack down on NFTs is if you look at the SEC sort of going after Yuga Labs and others to sort of make a case that, uh, you know, they could be, um, you know, instrument, you know, trading instruments or, or, or otherwise. So uh, I, I think it will be quite some time before governments use NFTs and that probably has a lot to do with the folks who are, who are currently in government too. You know, there's, it, I think we've all seen the videos of uh, some of our, at least in the U S um, uh, you know, Apple and Google and uh, Amazon sort of testifying in front of Congress and, you know, them trying to explain you know, what, what Facebook is and, you know, how, how they make money and, you know, like the, the basic concepts of like almost like the internet in today's day and age to these, you know, senators and congressmen who obviously are, are uh, you know, not keeping up as much of the time. So um, I think we're just trying to get them to crypto right now. I know there's a lot of educational efforts, uh, you know, here that, you know, uh, our, our team, our, um, our serve leadership is trying to do and, and get folks smart before the elections, but NFTs, I think are a, way, a ways off. Yeah. I I'd probably share that view. I just uh, submitted a local council development approval where I've got wet ink, wet ink uh, signatures uh, with carbon copy paper underneath. So um, I think we might be a ways away from definitely local government, but uh, hopefully they can get up the curve uh, faster than, um, than we're expecting. So changing gears a little bit and looking at investment approach, uh, one of the Binance users is looking at a market from a three-pronged approach. So looking at it from a macro perspective, looking at the, the fundamentals, and that's on-chain. What are the on-chain metrics? And then thirdly, from a charting point of view, the technical analysis. Is there anything else that they should be looking at? What does your research say to look at when evaluating the market or crypto assets? Sure. So yeah, I'll give you uh, sort of my framework. You know, Masari is an entity. We don't do any direct investing, but we um, inform the investment process of uh, a lot of institutional investors, hedge funds, venture capitalists, asset allocators. Um, and sort of the way that I personally think about things is especially uh, at this juncture, macro is really driving the bus. So that's macro in a sense of starting with the US dollar, starting with the US economy and inflation and sort of the baseline for all other assets in the world at the moment. And then working through that into uh, potentially where we could be going uh, directionally. I don't think it's very easy uh, to make uh, broad macro call calls, but um, you know, 
are liquidity conditions improving, declining? Is inflation slowing, um, improving or interest rates, you know, moving up or down? Um, you know, sort of a lot of the broad uh, things you would look at to determine, um, you know, is it a risk on or risk off environment? Uh, from there, you start to look at, you know, crypto more specifically, and you start to look at crypto subsectors. You start to look at uh, and talk about big trends and themes. And this is something we do internally um, to inform our research process. You know, if you were able to catch a lot of the big themes and trends um, within crypto, whether it's DeFi or NFTs or some of the emerging trends, you know, we think decentralized social and gaming and under collateralized lending and things like that. Um, could be the next big trends. Uh, if you were able to latch onto those early, um, it's it, it's less important to pick a specific winner rather than bet on sort of the broad trend, especially if you have sort of the, the broader uh, macro tailwinds behind you. Um, so if you have the broader macro, macro tailwinds behind you, if you are able to get the specific um, crypto investment trend right, and it's about looking at the actual protocols uh, instead of taking sort of a basketing approach of just betting on a few uh, protocols in, in one of those sectors. So, you know, what do we look at in terms of fundamentals um, for protocols? You know, we look at how many users are, are, are using the protocol. So that could be active ad addresses. Um, for example, we look at transaction volumes. We look at developer metrics. Um, you know, we try to talk to these teams directly to understand who they are, what they're building, why they're building it, and how they differentiate themselves from their competition. Um, I think there's a lot of value uh, in really just looking at a wide range of protocols in one sector. And then you start to, you know, at first it might not make sense in terms of what you should be looking at, but after a while you get a sense of, um, oh, hey, this protocol's doing this, but this one's not, you know, why is that? You start to be able to form a little mental map. Um, so, you know, starting really top level and drilling all the way down to the bottom until you see a specific trend and then finding the key metrics within that sector that you can hit on and finding a potential um, investment opportunity within it. Um, the last point I would say on that fundamental side is looking at the tokenomics. Uh, I, I don't think there's very few protocols today that have strong tokenomics. So that would be value accrual back to the token holder in some form of um, you know, value capture through transaction metrics or volumes or um, sort of what have you. Uh, most of them are inflationary at this point. They're sort of like, you know, kind of growth stocks with no revenue um, yeah. and you're betting on a future vision. Um, and then you want to look at sort of the inflation schedule and all those other good things you, you think about when you think about tokenomics. Uh, so that's a lot of the framework on kind of the fundamental macro side. Last piece I had mentioned in the question is, uh, I don't think technicals, at least in my view, are very relevant. I think they're sort of a self-fulfilling prophe prophecy, uh, especially in more efficient markets. That being said, crypto is not a very efficient market at the moment. So there is, I think, some merit to technicals in crypto and key levels because you're trading with a lack of fundamentals for a lot of these assets. So it's not something to completely ignore. But I think you should have, especially if you're investing in crypto, a more long-term mindset where it's very easy to get washed out uh, of your account, um, moving through a lot of, you know, sort of uh, try to trade a lot of volatility. Yeah, no, good, good insights there. And I think, um, yeah, looking at all those sort of buckets, plus being able to spot those trends um, to sort of pick out those gems or at least the, the themes um, is probably key. Following on to that, uh, we had a question around some of the alternative data that could be used. Um, so maybe looking at traditional markets, there's some uh, data you can use like you know, satellite imagery, movement of, of shipping vessels, et cetera. I think this, um, this customer must have been watching billions or something, but um, are there any of those alternative sources of data that you've used before or that you've seen that have given a window into some market opportunities? So right now in crypto, I don't think it's about having some secret data set. I think it's actually about having the correct data set and knowing that it's accurate. Um, we've been lucky enough to partner with the graph to go directly on chain for these protocols and get the direct uh, data from the protocol itself. You have a lot of aggregators and third party providers who try to do the same thing. And, and we found a lot of them to be... Um, somewhat inaccurate when you actually go to the source. So the closer to the source of truth you can get to, uh, 
I think the better. And I think the, the great thing about crypto is, you know, the source of truth is readily accessible for all of us. So getting there, actually understanding what you're looking at is the real source of alpha um, at the moment. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of value in just really being able to get to the, the lowest level possible. Okay. So look at the blockchains, look at the uh, ether scans, et cetera, and, and look at Masari to, to get that sort of fundamental information about what the data flows are actually like. Good point. Um, so let's, let's move more into the weeds, some of those technical discussions. Um, this one's quite topical in terms of the you know, consensus mechanism. Ethereum's obviously moved from proof of work across to proof of stake. Do you see any issues with it becoming too centralized uh, from a nation state issue? Do you see risks there? So um, I think most would consider proof of work fairly decentralized. So the challenge becomes proof of stake has some centralization factor vectors today. Um, you know, what are those? If you look at Ethereum, you know, you have this new mechanism where you have builders build the blocks, proposers pr propose the blocks to the blockchain. And there's, um, you know, a level of the builders can censor transactions before handing them over to the proposers to propose to the blockchain. And you've seen block builders like Flashbots actually censor transactions. Um, you know, tr Tornado Cash transactions are, are the ones that are sort of sanctioned here in the US through OFAC. And Flashbots has chosen to exclude those in their block building process. Um, that is a potential centralization vector and an issue and then potentially could be something the government um, could see as, you know, uh, a potential issue as well. Um, you know, Ethereum in particular is, is, knows this is a problem and is trying to address it as is Flashbots. They're trying, um, you know, to sort of open source their technology and get others to build blocks and um, provide sort of relay solutions and, um, you know, there's other solutions that are coming down the line. But, um, you know, I think, you know, longer term, um, it could be a potential issue, but uh, I don't think it's the main thing governments are looking at right now. I think they have a lot of uh, other low hanging fruit on their plate they could attack. Yeah. Um, and there's all and there's also, you know, good bills on the table to uh, to fall back on that hopefully reasonable people can agree upon, including the safe harbor provisions that have been um in the U.S. where you have some level of time to decentralize before being, you know, immediately called a security. But um, as I think all people who are probably listening to this know, there's a huge battle in, in terms of what is going to be called a, a token here in the U.S. at least um, between the, C, the CFTC and the SEC. So, um, you know, proof of stake is certainly going to be uh, one central point of that debate. But you know, hopefully these networks can solve a lot of the problems before that becomes, um, you know, something that's a, a real issue. Yeah, thank you. It sounds like we could spend uh, half an hour or a whole episode just on, just on that particular topic. I know it's an important yeah. one. Um, in terms of, say, the Layer 2 technologies, uh, are you seeing some standouts amongst them or do you think that there's likely to be a migration to a you know, winner-takes-all type atmosphere? Uh, in terms of that L2 competition? Yeah, so I think um, L2s are going to sort of be a power law game. Bridging in my mind between these different ecosystems, so you can bridge between Arbitrum and Optimism through the hot bridge today. Um, that is always going to be risky. And we've seen it the past, you know, we've had two hacks this week of $100 million plus. Uh, and Vitalik himself has said this earlier this year, that bridging uh, is always going to be inherently very risky. So I think one or two of these ecosystems are really going to win out. Optimism and Arbitrum is certainly winning at the moment. I think longer term, it's not going to be optimistic rollups. It's going to be ZK rollups, specifically ZK EBMs, where you're able to sort of port over your contracts directly uh, without any... Um, additional sort of configuration that will enable sort of, uh, you know, quick uh, uptime and quick scalability for a lot of these applications. Um, so longer term, I think you're going to see one of these three, either Scroll, ZK Sync, or, you know, Polygon, who are competing right now with ZK EVMs, to actually um, be the winner in this space. And 
I'm not sure it's going to be the first one to come to market with a ZK EVM. I think it's probably going to be one of the ones that has sort of the best business development capabilities and is actually able to, um, you know, onboard users and onboard developers uh, to use their product. Um, if you look at the technology differences between them, they're sort of almost minute um, and some improvements versus one another, but it's really going to be who can attract the, the users and the developers um, longer term. Yep. Yeah, understood. Um, so I think we'll round things out here with user adoption um, and the importance of decentralization, the use of decentralization. I've got three questions in that bucket. Um, we'll first start with NFTs. We've seen, I guess, some interest in NFTs in gaming by more sort of traditional uh, gaming shops. Um, where do you see that adoption of gaming NFTs? And do you think uh, I guess, increased retention for those users uh, or increased adoption of those NFTs could be a catalyst for traditional gaming shops wanting to incorporate more of that sort of Web3 um, atmosphere? Yeah, it just seems like such a no-brainer, gaming NFTs. If you have ever played a game and you've worked hard and uh, spent a lot of hours or potentially money to upgrade your character or sword or whatever. And then you, um, you know, the game suddenly changes its rules and you can't take that with you uh, or you can't monetize it. That's really frustrating. And actually that was the reason Vitalik created Ethereum because I think his, you know, sword or something got, got taken away after all these hours. So it seems like such he's, a no brainer technical predictor of, uh, of web three adoption and uh, <laughs> where, where web three ends up going too. So it might be a smart one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but, you know, it's sort of been funny that the gamers have pushed back on Web3 because I think a lot of them view their gaming time as more of an outlet and they don't want to monetize everything they do. But, you know, over time, I think you don't have to have Web3 in the front of everything. It's just um, a better interface and better sort of mechanism and marketplace for, you know, um, you know monetizing and, and potentially improving a lot of the ROI and your time that you're spending in, in these games. The challenge to date, I think, has just been finding a fun game. Um, you know, all the games that have you know, been popular today, sort of Axie Infinity or Step In, or, you know, a lot of these things are, um, you know, not immediately like a, you know, World of Warcraft or Starcraft type fun. Uh, I think we're going to get there very quickly. It's just going to be a little bit of time because if you're developing a AAA game, these studios take, you know, two, three, four years to develop games. I mean, some take 10. Uh, and you've seen a lot of really cool games in development, Star Atlas, Alluvium, uh, many others that I think are really going to um, potentially change the landscape and onboard a lot of users um, because that's what we really need. We need some killer app to onboard a, a new set of users. Right now, I think you only have something like 30 million people a day or 30 million people a month actually using Ethereum, which is an enormously low number if we think this is sort of the future um, you know, of, of sort of the internet. Uh, one area that I think is starting to catch a little bit of traction, though, is sort of sports NFTs, you know, sports cards on the blockchain. Um, that's been a really cool area. You've seen NBA Top Shot, So Rare, um, NFL All Day. Uh, there's a few La Liga ones. Like a lot of those sports games just seem like natural transitions onto the blockchain. I think that's a nice avenue um, for collectors and fans to sort of monetize their hobby. So that, that's been a first mover, and I expect all these other games to come once they've had time to actually develop. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, looking at decentralization, you know, what, why do you think it's important to have decentralized exchanges, you know, decentralized identity, uh, decentralized protocols, rather than, you know, centralized incumbents that we've seen in say traditional finance or traditional markets or web two. Um, and then secondly is what sort of impact do you think these recent De DeFi exploits have had on that and on adoption there? Without decentralization, we are just um, making FinTech 2.0, 3.0. Um, you know, decentralization really means trustlessness. It really means being able to um, interact between different parties without needing uh, someone in between us who, um, you know, takes a cut, who takes a fee, who, uh, you know, has to pass some sort of judgment on our transaction. Um, you know, if we're not here for decentralization, then we're just becoming sort of, uh, you know, Silicon Valley 2.0, which is, um, 
I don't think the zero to one sort of moment, a lot of us are, are thinking about crypto um, and, and thinking about what it can actually be. Uh, I think these Def De DeFi sort of exploits um, serve to actually really push back a lot of the progress we've made so far. And it really hurts the new user adoption when you see every week or two a new headline of $100 million being taken mm -hmm. from some protocol that does not encourage new users to come on, um, does not encourage you new builders to come on. Um, you know, if you think about sort of just the the builder base in, in Web three today, you have twenty thousand or so developers. I mean, there's over thirty million developers worldwide. So you know, there we need to bring those people on. We need to bring the new users on, and having these unsafe protocols and having these exploits is really uh, sort of hurting uh, everyone. I'm actually encouraged by a lot of the new protocols that are coming out. I think a lot of people think Aptos and Sui and others are sort of VC potential cash grab chains. But what I find fundamentally interesting is they're using a new language called Move, which rethinks, um, rethinks actual uh, blockchain languages from the ground up. So you have languages like Rust that are Web2 native, Solidity, which is developed for blockchains a long time ago. Um, but Rust actually says, here's what blockchains are best uh, for, and here's what um, we can actually create with blockchains uh, and provides a lot of the security assurances from the base level that Solidity and others sort of don't. Um, so I'm excited to see a lot of new primitives built using Rust and, um, you know, provide a level of safety or sorry, using Move um, and provide a level of safety from that base layer. And you've actually seen uh, Solana talk about integrating um, Move as well. So I think that could be another catalyst for potential adoption is just really a lot of chains thinking about using Move, which provides a lot more safety. It also provides a lot more flexibility. Um, and hopefully gives, uh, you know, these hacks lessen over time and we can bring in a new set of users. Yeah. I mean, looking at those, um, particularly Aptos and Sui, you know, their background of the founders is Web 2 and trying to push into Web 3. And now they've gone their own route. So bringing in these new technologies is sort of telling me that they've seen where there are some pitfalls and some issues in Web 2, and they can bring these tools to Web 3 to, to fix that and solve for that, which I think is cool. Uh, the other takeaway that I had was it's still so early. Uh, I know we say that a lot, but you touched on 30 million monthly active users. Uh, you touched on only 20,000 developers, which is what, less than 1% of all developers. Uh, so there's just a ton more growth um, and building to come, which I think is exciting. With, say, the future of uh, adoption, increasing those numbers, what do you think is the biggest barrier? Is it education? Is it tools around onboarding? Is it just better UX? What do you think we need to, to move that needle? So I think um, more simply, it's applications people actually want to use and uh, applications that are easy to use. If you had to tell your mother or grandmother to use Ethereum today, it would be an enormous headache for them, I'm sure, you know, and, and you just explaining it would be it would be a challenge. And then they'd sort of be at the end, like kind of what's what's the point? Why are we doing this? So I, I think you really need to find a killer application, a killer use case that onboards people, but then also makes it really easy for them to use and stay Um in the ecosystem, you know, they can't be having to go to layer two and then bridge back to layer one and then do a transaction and, you know, send it to another chain. It all needs to look and feel like web two while being web three on the back end. And that's how we really bring people on board. And that's how we really get new users is by making this easy while still having a lot of the decentralization and other assurances and other advances that this industry has really brought. Um, but while making it easy for people right now, it's, it's pretty hard. Yeah, no, fair point there. And I think uh, a lot more adoption, um, making things easier for users um, is going to lead to a bigger and better market for everyone. Um, just trying to avoid some of these exploits. So, you know, get those builders building better and, um, you know, being one step ahead of the curve. But Tom, thank you so much for this today, answering those direct questions that we had from our users. Um, it was an absolute th thrill for me. Um, I'll be honest, one of those questions was, uh, was one of mine. Um, so thank you for answering those. And yeah, look forward to potentially doing this again in the future. 
would love to come back. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you.